Um, my name is Tim Lorden. I happen to be the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, I think many of you know me. Um, I am honored to be, have been asked to moderate this particular session uh, called Growing Up with a Mobile Net and it's hosted, coordinated by Common Sense Media. And it's a focus on how youth use mobile media and, and policy issues surrounding that. And we have about 50 minutes to kind of go through a tremendous amount of material. Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening in this space. There's always a lot of thing, interesting things happening in this space. Um, but recently, there's some provocative uh, policy developments. There's some provocative statements in the press. There's pr some provocative pieces of legislation introduced, and we'd like to discuss those a little bit in detail uh, rather than talking, you know, at a very high level about digital citizenship. Maybe get you know get down to uh, some brass tacks here. Um, as I said, Common Sense Media, which is our, our partner on this, they're hosting, they're coordinating this particular session at about. 11.50, uh, we are going to end this session. Hopefully we'll get to q and I'm not sure. Um, then we'll be setting the table, uh, and we'll be then starting the State of the Mobile Net Conference at about 12. Uh, we have comments from Senator Leahy, uh, co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, Anna Eshoo, uh, Congressman Bob Lada, who's the first, uh, one of the first member of Congress to introduce his own app, so we're pretty excited about that. But um, let's, let me just get going really quickly with this. Um, the, the, this is, the, the growing up of the mobile net section, what we wanted to do is look at a couple of different issues um, related to how youth use mobile media um, and the, the p policy issues related to that, the educational opportunities, the educational benefits, uh, the privacy and security concerns, and the safety concerns uh, that a lot of people are articulating, and we wanted to explore them and the pros and cons. Um, let me just introduce the, the topic, uh, so to speak. Um, tremendous amount of, it, it's a foregone conclusion that teens, young people, are using mobile media. Um, be, be up until you know several years ago, it was uh, using it to text and, and talk with their friends. Uh, now, um, smartphones have enabled a whole different set of devices. We also have iPads, which was an I, the I, first iPad was introduced in the market last summer. Uh, it is is proliferating. It's and it's now it's totally conceivable where you can see the end of of young people actually having to carry out on books in their backpacks, and they'll be using tablets. It is a foregone conclusion that this is where it's all going to go. Um, I don't think anyone disputes that. It's totally foreseeable at this point. And the question is, from a policy perspective, what do we do? Um, let me ask. Let me just say, um, Ann Collier, uh, who is a great safety advocate out in uh, Utah. Uh, just pointed to me to a statement by the National Association of Secondary School Principals, um, and they made a statement uh, saying that uh, they, for school leaders, they should encourage uh, and model the appropriate and responsible use of mobile and social technology to maximize students' opportunities to create and share content. So there's this theme that you know young people should be using more and more mobile devices for educational purposes and for development and learning. And just on Monday, I believe it was, um, the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, um, and I want to get the quote correctly. I don't have actually the text of his speech, but he basically said that his philosophy is that for education, you need to start really, really, really young age for social networking to explore the educational benefits. Um, he he said that at a summit, uh, an education summit in California. So let me just uh, just introduce that that topic about um, the appropriate role of uh, mobile media in education when it comes to youth. Uh, in schools and in libraries and, and elsewhere. Um, Alan uh, Simpson from Common Sense Media, who is the Vice President of Policy. Um, Alan, I didn't even introduce him, I'm going so quickly. Um, Alan is uh, the Vice President of Common Sense Media, and before that he was with a lot of different youth organizations, including the National Association for Education of Young Children um, and Voices for Illinois Children. He also had posts at NPR and C-SPAN. Uh, Adam Thayer is the, the, he's the director at the Mercatus Institute. Formerly, he was president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. He had previous posts at the Cato Institute. Um, Adam has actually written uh, more books than I've read. Um, and he also uh, has served on many Blue Ribbon panels on, on youth online safety and privacy. And, and down the end is, uh, of course, Jules Polonetsky, uh, who is now the director of the Future Privacy Forum. Uh, before that, uh, Jules was all things trust and safety at AOL. He was the chief privacy officer. Uh, before that, he was a chief privacy officer for DoubleClick, and I guess it was in a kind of a different version back in the early 2000s. And before that, he was um, the consumer safety advocate under Mayor Rudy Giuliani in New York. So let me just go to the question of education uh, in, in use of mobile media. Let me just start off with, um, with uh, Alan, and then we can go down, go down the list. Thanks, Tim. Um, I guess the main thing I'd say on the education front, last year at State of the Mobile Net, 
thanks to Tim. Uh, Common Sense Media co-hosted two panels at the early part of the day, again, looking at what kids are doing in the mobile space. And one of them we focused entirely on the educational opportunities that mobile brings to learning, both in school, at home, in between. Um, and the changes just in a year are dramatic and many of them wonderful to see. At Common Sense Media, we're firm believers in the opportunities that technology, and especially mobile technology, bring to learning. Um, you hear a lot of interesting discussions these days in, about not just let's bring laptops to all of our kids, but oh. heck, a lot of our kids have smartphones already. How do we change the rules so that they can use the devices they have in a learning environment? We had a presenter last year who was from uh, a principal from Newport News and talked about how the smartphones his kids are using and others that he brought into the classroom with help from local industry were helping Con connect his kids to the overall learning experience, but also specifically helping with algebra and pre-algebra. We believe at Common Sense Media that there are enormous opportunities brought by this technology. We also recognize there are some downsides, and one of the points we made last year that I think is important to surface is that that principal is sticking his neck out in Newport News. People like that are, are on the advanced edge trying to make sure their kids are getting the best of technology and media in the classroom. But when things go wrong with that technology and media, and they can, and we've all seen examples, I'm not trying to stir trouble up as much as recognize that there are some potential problems out there. When things go wrong with those experiments, that principal is the one who gets fired or at least gets his experiment cut back, and the opportunity he's trying to build gets reduced. So we view this world overall as it reflects on kids and learning, again, as a space with enormous opportunities. Mobile can bring fascinating changes to the learning space. We just have to also manage the downsides that it can bring, whether it's kids texting instead of uh, doing their homework or kids abusing each other with their mobile devices. We can go into the, all of the details, but it's important for schools and teachers and parents and kids to be prepared to deal with those downsides so that we get the best of the upsides. Adam, I guess a question on the education side, the you know the upsides, the downsides, and do we really need social networking for education purposes? Yeah, I think we do. I think we're going to find that there's a lot of uh, violent agreement on this front about the importance of education uh, being so crucial in this debate. Um, and few have done a better job on this front, in my opinion, than our co-hosts here today, Common Sense Media. I'm again going to plug a report, since uh, Alan fails to do it every time I'm on a panel with him, I end up plugging more Common Sense Media stuff than he talks about. But their recent report on digital literacy and citizenship in the 21st century is just uh, wonderful. There, there it is. Hold it up. I'll get the residual later. Uh, and I, I really think that it points out the, the essential fact of life, which is that we have to acknowledge that, you know, Kids are online more than ever. They're, they have these digital devices in their lives, mobile devices. I begin all of my work with the assumption that the kids will find a way to get online onto certain sites, to use certain devices, whether we like them using those sites or devices or not. We have got to find a way to create better, more well-lit communities online, if you will, um, through the use of media literacy, digital citizenship, also industry uh, out awareness and outreach efforts. Um, and that's going to require a lot of effort, and it's going to require money, um, but I think that's money better spent than a lot of the other things we'll probably discuss today on the regulatory front. Uh, Jules? Well, my son uh, uses uh, his Nintendo DS, and he plays against his friends. He doesn't consider himself social networking. I don't consider him social networking, and I think it's really hard to draw the line between social networking the hubbub of a lot of things that somehow seems to be tied together that, that are succeeding for some companies that have kind of hit the sweet spot. And all of those features which exist in some interactive way on, frankly, websites with HTML5, and we keep talking about smartphones. Zuckerberg uh, was speaking yesterday at uh, the G8 and it was streamed, so I was watching some of it, having missed that glamorous collection of world leaders, but he was talking about the enormous amount of traffic that they get, not on an app downloaded onto your smartphone, but people using dumb phones, I think that the, the word is feature phones, um, to have all, you know, a, a pretty good subset of that same set of interactivity. And so um, the idea of saying that because it has this great title, it somehow comes with this giant set of risks. The technology today, whether it's a website, whether it's the most basic phone, whether it's just his Nintendo, which is going to stream movies and lets him play, uh, these dumb devices have become smarter than 
the most sophisticated things that we were thinking of years ago when we were talking about websites that were doing registration. The other little point that I'll uh, make, um, the ACT guys were showing me some apps built by moms to help entertain kids on uh, road trips. Um, telling the mother or telling the kid that all the things that kind of expects that th these things can do because he understands it's, it's on a phone, it's, it's on the web, uh, sorry, it can't work. You can't ask your dad for help because suddenly that crossed this interactivity barrier. Um, it, those barriers and those lines are no longer there anymore. And separate from learning about actual education, how do we actually expect anybody to learn? We're all stumbling through. Uh, the other day there was a party in my neighborhood and uh, I wasn't invited to it. And people were posting about it, like some people I knew. And I thought like I was through with this kind of stuff. Like that was like high school and college where like, you know, you learned about a party and you were offended. And I, I wasn't that good friends with the guy who had the party, but you know, I wouldn't have been surprised. And, but all of my grown up, you know, 45 year old peers didn't think twice that they were posting pictures and maybe some people might not be invited, right? They weren't thinking and they, they're going through this learning process. How do we expect people to kind of be cut off and then, by the way, you're in now, sink or swim. We've got to figure out a way to introduce these features, not just your parent says it's okay, your parent doesn't say that it's okay. We've got to create those highly interactive environments, and we need to figure out how to shape it so that it doesn't create risks and dangers and predators and all that sort of thing. But, but we have no choice. Okay, so uh, that brings up some, you know, what, what's parents' parents' role? I mean, it's all moving very, very quickly. Um, everything's happening on these mobile devices. Um, let me just, because we have very little time, let me just throw it out there. Um, it, recently in, in, this, in the California State, the Senate, um, there was a piece of inter legislation introduced called uh, SB 242, introduced by uh, uh, Senator Corbett. And, and basically one of the provisions is that she says, well, listen, you know, if parents want to build, parents should have the right and social networking sites should allow them to, to go into their children's um, um, social networking profile and delete uh, personal information about them that they shouldn't be putting out there for, from a safety perspective. Um, how do we feel about you know proposals that are those paternalistic or is that just good parenting? And and should social networking sites and or you know legislation kind of enable parents to be able to do that, empower them? Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I share your concern about the being the overly paternalistic aspect of that, but it's all going to get in that blurry space of what age child are we talking about? You know, for, for young kids, we pretty much expect that parents will have some sort of refereeing role and very much a gatekeeper role over what they don't do and having that ability to protect their kids and to clean up after mistakes that their kids make. I think most people will find that somewhat sensible it's going to get more troubling when you're talking about teens because then you're talking about parents as as colleagues of ours and many people in this room have probably expressed older teens especially most want privacy from their own parents and so there are going to be some real conflicting concerns there so that's one of the things we're looking out at that bill in particular and i know a lot of people have expressed some concerns about it but the base point of either a parent or the teen him or herself having the ability to say all right, I put that on a social networking site. Now I want to remove it, and I, I, I'm not comfortable with being up there. I made a mistake. That's a concept, the eraser button that we proposed in our privacy paper back in December that I think is very important. Well, let me um, also note at this point, normally at this point I would go to um, uh, Dina Sintis, who is from Carnegie Mellon University, um, and she was going to be the, the fourth panelist that we had, would be more of a kind of a, uh, it would be a, an additional, you know, youth online uh, advocate. Um, she had uh, emergency surgery, surgery scheduled for her daughter unexpectedly, so uh, she wasn't able to make it. So if I, I'll be a little more provocative and, and try to kind of um, articulate maybe from that side of the discussion going further, but um, what is wrong with that, Adam? Why can't parent, why couldn't, shouldn't parents actually have the ability to kind of, you know, go in and, and, and delete things that their, their children shouldn't be putting out there? Well, in some ways they can already do some of those things and through exercising typical parental oversight and mentoring, they can go in and do a lot with their online presence for their children. But the question is if you have formal legislation, especially like the sort of thing we're seeing in California, the first problem begins with the fact that it's a state bill and we're regulating something that's clearly interstate in nature and that's going to create some serious <coughs> constitutional issues I won't go into. Yeah, fair enough. But <clears throat> the, the question of having a, an affirmative parental consent model that expands upon COPPA, which I know we'll discuss more in a moment, uh, is that you very quickly run into the question of how do you verify the parent-child relationship for purposes of data deletion online so that it doesn't create a backdoor to a potential abusive situations where people are deleting data that shouldn't be deleting data. 
Um, there's also the question of how do you sort of age verify or segment? You know, what are the rules for under 13 versus 13 to 18 versus adults? Because the problem is the world that the bill, the California 242 bill is trying to uh, regulate is really the world of Facebook and sort of mixed audience sites like, like Facebook, MySpace, other things where you'd have all sorts of ages. So if you're going to have a situation like that, you very quickly get into the question of, well, do teens have any right to post there? How do you determine their teens? How do you determine their relationship with parents? And we very quickly get down the road of a potential internet online authentication or age verification sort of uh, okay. paradigm being necessary. Well, Jules, you, you were the chief trust officer, chief safety officer, chief privacy officer for AOL. Um, you had some of the best parental controls and parental participation you know, for that site um, around. Um, how hard is it to you know, try to negotiate that parent-child relationship and, and abide by that from the company's perspective? Well, I guess it depends on whether you want to um, make any money or be effective. And, and here, here's what I mean by that. Um, we had credit cards of parents who were paying us for their ISP service, and they created accounts for kids and teens, and they were in control of those sub accounts. They used a credit card. Um, we never made any money on the kids and teens services. We were happy to have those services, but if that's what um, had powered AOL, it wouldn't be around anymore. We had a billion dollar, you know, ISP revenue coming off there. So, um, for a huge amount of expense. And forcing people to actually identify themselves with a credit card, not that that's a perfect way to do it, um, you could, in theory, in a kludgy way, know that one account had control over the other. Um, really, really hard. You know what we would have all the time? We'd have a soldier killed you know, in Iraq, and we'd have their parents want to have you know, access to that account. Um, and we'd have to have them fax us a birth certificate. It's enormously expensive. There's a huge amount of overhead. And I don't even want to get into the issue of whether the kid puts up information saying he's 16 and he's proud to come out as gay and the parent says right. that's terrible it's no you're not going to get a job but facebook take that down myspace take that down you know w w w this is parent kids stuff and it's hard stuff and sort of avoiding these difficult issues right because we're assuming here the parent the kid can take this down we're assuming the parent knows about it and the teen doesn't want to take it down and so we want to pull the social media sites into the middle of this conversation that we're not completely comfortable dealing with today, raising all sorts of challenging constitutional issues. Well, so I don't think it's feasible. And uh, just one thing on the eraser button. Well, let's, let me hold off on the eraser button just one second. Um, you, um, I want to get to free speech rights of teens, but you actually mentioned something really, really provocative. That let me just let me see if I can uh, be a little bit um, uh, provocative here. You had said that you know the reason, the way that you had at least a kludgy is that kludgy? Kludgy. I'm not even familiar what that means, but I I, I think it means uh, a, a good enough way of figuring out uh, who the parent was. Um, you the parent was actually paying money. There was some kind of like purse string. Now when I was a kid and you know back in like the 50s, the idea was that if I wanted to do something, play a video game, go to a movie, uh, do other things, play an arcade game, um, I had to say, you know, Dad, can you pry up in your wallet? Can you give me five bucks? And you say, well, what do you want it for? And so there was a kind of a certain purse string of parental control, right? And in you're saying with AOL that kind of was a, a kludgy way to do it, but now we have a really robust and dynamic advertising ecosystem here, right? And what I'm trying to say is, um, let me just ask you a question. You're going to say no, of course, but isn't there some kind of sites that are making money on advertising and, and fueling their services on advertising for younger people, or even if they kind of have an idea that younger people are there, isn't there some kind of responsibility since they've kind of severed those purse strings of parental control through advertising revenue? Don't they need to kind of step up the way that AOL did with you know taking a loss on uh, you know servicing you know you know kid uh, teen appropriate kid appropriate uh, content? Uh, don't they need to take some responsibility there um, for severing those purse strings of parental control? So we're talking about every website in the world, more or less, right? Because again, I, I don't see this hard line between you're a social network and you're big enough. Um, but by the way, it doesn't apply to anybody else who's completely free or mostly free or is still losing, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Number uh, number one. So I'm not quite sure that the economics su uh, support it. Um, and I think when you take a look at the overhead that exists today, I mean, Facebook takes down I think 20,000 kids accounts every single day. So I assume if you hired an army uh, and you were willing to accept the fact that you were often going to take down accounts that were not 
kids' accounts, but that were somebody you know messing around well, you with said his kids. But I'm just I can, for, teens. for that many teens, you know, like I was right. I was a teenager asking my father for five bucks, and he always said no. But that's a different story, right? Look, the the sponsor of the um, the state bill said. Uh, I don't see why it's a problem. School districts are able to, you know, authenticate who's a parent. So why can't, you know, social networks or, or websites? And I think that is just in incredibly naive. We don't have a system today um, that perfectly, you know, allows you to identify yourself in a way that is sure enough. Well, that, that's a different question. I think that's a different question, a, a specific uh, answer. But I think just in general, shouldn't, shouldn't the way that advertising kind of cuts parents out of the equation by giving away free services, which we all agree are great. Like, I love all the services I get for free online. But shouldn't there be some kind of responsibility, uh, additional responsibility, rather than saying, well, it's the, go the, goose that kills the, uh, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs? But sure. If, you're, if, you're, if you've got a kids' audience, if you've got a teen's audience, you've got to put the bandwidth into policing it, taking down inappropriate so an added content. So you believe there's an added responsibility because of um, cutting parents out of the equation with advertising free content? You, you keep saying cutting parents out of the equation with advertising. I mean, the media world as we know it, not just online but off, is very much powered by advertising, of course. And I don't necessarily think that that's the test. I think the better test <coughs> is, you know, does a site cater to kids or do could kids maybe be in the audience? Yeah. That's, that's the better test, not well, the what's your business model. You say, you say the, so, the, main, the mainstream media, you're talking about broadcast television, broadcast yeah, radio, yeah, and I know where which has certain next. rules about it that. And, and the motion, of course, the other theaters types have, of, I mean, newspapers primarily advertising, right, uh, supported. And yet we, we not don't much anymore. But. Yeah, that's right. Losing it quickly. The point is, is that advertising has been the mother's milk of media in this country throughout our history. And that shouldn't necessarily be the test for how we regulate and, and determine corporate responsibility. I think the better question or test is, you know, how much do you cater to children? Or how often are kids in your audience? Now, the question of responsibility is there. And I would agree with Jules that there needs to be some added responsibility for these sites that do cater to kids. Whether it's legalistic is really the sticky question here, right? What kind of form does that responsibility take on as a matter of law? I mean, do we deputize all intermediaries to clean up the net, like some in Congress would like to favor, when they you know, advocate really sweeping regulatory measures for the internet? I think that's a bad approach. But do, do sites need to be held to a, a higher standard, and do they need to have more controls? I think the answer is yes, but how we get there is the tough question. Okay, I, want um, to pick, I want to pick up, though, quickly, Tim, on one of the things, to echo what you were saying. There is, in the spirit of COPPA, all the way back 12, 13 years ago, it was made very clear that a lot of the intent was about protecting and preserving the role of parents and recognizing that the online world even then circumvented the parent's ability as a gatekeeper. So that is one of the pieces on the table that we have to, all of us, not just through regulation, but industry I think needs to be more in the game of seeing what can be brought to the table to empower parents to be more engaged in these discussions. And then I want to make one second point because this is about mobile. I think there are enormous opportunities and full disclosure, I'm a history major, not a technologist, but I think a lot of the folks in the mobile space could be doing a lot more to put parent tools in place that are about IDing who the kids are, if parents want them. And I've made this point in a, to, to, with many of you in conversations. If I go to the store to buy four phones for me and my kids, you have a unique opportunity as the provider to enable me, not, not require me, but to give me the opportunity to signature each of those phones so that the three of them belonging to my kids are age signatured in a way that I want and are signatured back to me as the parent of those three kid phones. Similar to the way that Jules did back in the day at AOL. Uh, you have, here's the credit card, there's my account, and there's two, three sub, sub accounts for AOL and for my kids. But you know, I take seriously some of the caution that Dana Boyd points out uh, in that, you know, should we be, parental controls are appropriate, and, and the goal usually is, can we, you know, keep the kid away from a place where there's a predator or keep him away from porn? Do we want a surveillance society that, you know, if you're 16, if you're 17, if you're 15, you don't have any privacy online. The odd thing is we're talking about these places as sort of these public and exposed places compared to the home and the like. Um, kids feel, teens feel, that this is where they actually have some privacy even if their information is exposed because they don't expect teens, uh, their parents, to be peeking into their business, right? Your mom might go in your room, but she shouldn't go through your journal. Well, maybe there's some you know, tragic situation where she's going to want to. And so if the solution is completely in, for the sake of some outlier cases, massive surveillance, um, I think we've got to figure out how, when you start 
going a little bit older and you start going beyond 13, kids start reclaiming some little sense of autonomy and a way to express themselves. And guess what? If we heard the things our kids said, my nine-year-old has Gmail now and he's still at the phase where he thinks it's cool to forward me all his stuff and I have his password. The stupidity, and I haven't said anything, you know, Tim, about it, but, you know, you could see parents being highly offended um, if, you know, and we've all said things that, you know, maybe don't flatter us well. Get, let's give folks a little bit of room. They're not mini celebrities who have to worry, oh, my God, my job will be ruined, I, you know, if I set an off call. Let's give them a just, little space. Just, just briefly, we should mention that there's also constitutional law around this question, well, going back, you know, all the way to the Tinker case in 69 and, and – so on fourth, I mean, to the Bong Hits for Jesus case recently, I mean, the, the, the question of whether or not teens have some First Amendment rights has been resolved in favor of teens having some free speech rights. But which, depending on the age of the teen and what the issue it is. It does, not, and that makes it complicated. It's as blurry as everything else in that yeah, space. That, absolutely. I mean, where that line is drawn is really difficult. Yeah. And but, before we try to redesign the technology, check out how they're taking control of it, which is kind of cool. Facebook was criticized initially because, you know, when you – closed your account, you deactivated, but it was still there to come back. And they got some pressure from uh, the Canadian Privacy Commissioner, and they created a, you know, kill your account and just deactivate your account. And that deactivate, Dana does a nice job of describing, has become this great privacy feature for kids, or for teens who don't want things posted on their wall when they're not there and, you know, don't want to have to be uh, really aggressively managing. or And so they deactivate their account except when they're on. Who would have thought? And they did. So um, let me let me just we I could spend we could spend like all day talking about Dana Boyd's uh, any one of her papers, but um, let, let's we we had talked about free speech rights. I think um, the Bong Hits for Jesus case pretty much covered it for Adam. Uh, then we have what, we, what people wanted to talk about is the eraser button. Uh, there's different concepts of the eraser button that are uh, that are floating around here. Common Sense Media had a white paper recently about the eraser button. I can have them talk about that. Um, there's also uh, the Congressman Barton and Congressman Markey legislation on on youth privacy. Um, allows for an eraser button. Uh, there's other concepts in Europe which are kind of more about publicity um, and right to be forgotten, but I think that's a different animal. But at least on, what, uh, Alan, let me just kind of let you articulate at least what you had in the white paper and then it has it's been translated into legislation, I guess, um, about kind of the eraser button. Yeah, I mean, we don't want it to be confused or conflated with what's going on in Europe. The issue really is, to me, the eraser button, as we framed it, was very much a, a, a call to industry. It could also, as it's now been adopted, as more of a call from Congress. But it is about technological solutions, and it is in many ways about a big opt-out. We get in a lot of discussions about whether the, tend the, the, the standard here should be opt-in versus opt-out. We think for kids, the standard, the, the default should be toward opt-in. But an eraser button, if you argue that opt-out should continue to be the standard, an eraser button is a major opt-out. It's my ability to decide, as a 15-year-old or a 45-year-old, I'm done with this social networking site. I want to take either this photo down or all of these other things down. And I know Adam's going to say there are a lot of great tools to do that already. I don't think they're good enough. I don't think they're obvious enough. And I think the fact that we've got some really smart kids out, who've, out there who've figured out great ways to manage their own sites doesn't mean we have enough tools out there for all the other kids. In the Markey legislation, the Markey Barton legislation says if technologically feasible, uh, sites should allow you know, young people to do this. So, so a couple things. Uh, first of all, last time I checked, just about every social networking site offers the ability to delete an account. So that's sort of the ultimate uh, eraser button, if you will. That doesn't necessarily de delete all of the, the data and all the, the trail that you've left, depending on what the site retains. Um, but there's also other complicated issues associated with an eraser button or the so-called right to be forgotten. Uh, how about shared data? How about uh, commonly tagged photos on certain sites? Uh, how about sites uh, that you know you have all sorts of information sharing among peers and collaboration? Uh, who gets to hit this big red metaphysical sort of staples easy you know button that is going to be on everybody's desk? Where is that button? Where does it reside? That's complicated. It also raises some interesting free speech issues. Uh, and press freedom issues. I mean, information that's been put online and later is deleted, we sometimes used to refer to that as censorship, um, even if it's personal information, even if it's personal information about kids, and it's been reported somewhere else. It, there was a famous, you know, several famous cyberbullying cases in recent years, tragic cases. I wish some of that information would have been deleted by those girls and, and boys who put it online, but it later became newsworthy, and it spread all over the Internet. I mean, where do you start the, d the data deletion trail? How far back does it go? before we talk about violating speech and, and, and press rights. So I think we have to unpack all of those issues, whether we're encouraging sites to do more to delete data, or better yet, 
individuals and kids to delete data. I think that's an interesting proposal. You mentioned Ann Collier. She recently wrote a column about an, an innovative approach in a New York school called Data Delete Day. Brought everybody to the cafeteria, had them log on their social networking sites and said, kids, let's think about what you really don't need to have online or something you said that was particularly stupid or boneheaded or maybe cruel about one of your classmates recently. How about getting rid of that? I think that's great. That's part of media literacy and digital, digital citizenship. Let, let, me, let me push back on you a little bit because I'm, I'm trying to balance things off here. I mean, isn't, isn't, isn't youth the time to kind of, and aren't we pre-programmed to kind of naturally rebel, take some chances, experiment a little bit, kind of find ourselves, right? Sure. And, and sh shouldn't it, there should be a veil of at least some kind of like um, ability for, for youth to kind of experiment with that? I think that's evolutionarily a good, good thing developmentally. How are you pushing back against me? You're making my point. <laughs> but shouldn't you also, if you're a teen, say, you know what, I was really kind of, you know, playing around with my identity, playing around with some of those different concepts, but I really want to, uh, I want really to delete my data. But, but then, let's say, you know, I don't, there's a lot of different social networking, as you, as you pointed out in your book um, quite a bit, there's t hundreds and hundreds of different types of social networking sites, and frankly, it could be thousands, right? Um, so not all, all of them have different terms of service. I mean, that data that you post could actually be appropriated by a social networking site and be used in billboard ads or other things like that for, for a variety of different purposes for which they've carved out in their terms of service. Wouldn't legislation um, kind of give their a zone that that, that information Again, wouldn't in be repurposed in a, in and they could delete it? In a metaphysical sense, yes, it would. But practically speaking, we have to ask how that's enforced. If, if I'm a young teen... I'll tell you how it's forced. Let, let, let me tell you how it's forced. Maybe a social networking site would say, in their terms of service, the lawyers would say, well, we really can't you know, say we're going to use your, the child's information or the teen's information for um, derivative works or billboard ads or anything like that. Because if they want to delete this at some point, we, me, we can't. Let, let, I, I, Once it's on a billboard, the we have to go there. The stuff's interesting, but I'm, I'm, as always, more interested in the practical implications. How do we actually go about doing this if we think it's a good idea? I'll just give one concrete example that happens every day. There are discussion boards online dealing with all sorts of issues. One of them may be about, you know, discussing your sexuality or discussing maybe your, your life and maybe it's a miserable life and you're on a suicide hotline board or something. I mean, there could be a thread started that has 100 people commenting. They could be other teens, they could be adults, they could be counselors. And then three or four years later, I'm terribly embarrassed because I go to apply for a job and I think it could be something that could come back to haunt them. And I'm sympathetic to wanting to delete that. But what, do you delete that whole thread? Do you delete everything that everybody else said? I mean, wh wh what are the confines of this eraser button notion in terms of how much information we are trying to eliminate uh, from from the online. and you're saying just because it gets intertwined with other conversations, there's a, a free speech element there, and, and therefore it's so. unconstitutional. Well, the very issue of so. shared information and shared data does make it more confusing. But the the challenge of a photograph makes it not perfectly clear, but more clear and more interesting. Because if it is a photo of me, don't I have a right to take it down? If somebody and else th took it and put it on their page? That makes it interesting too. But it also opens up the uh, chest and helps us realize that no, actually, by posting that photo on various social networks. I've effectively licensed it to them. So you have and essentially I didn't a heckler's that. veto over any other speech you don't like about yourself online. Well, again, we're talking about a photo that I took yeah. of myself. Delete your account? I can delete my account, <laughs> but then I find out that actually I licensed that photo to the social network. Uh, yeah, and, 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 I, and I, they I'm, I'm willing it. to have a conversation about that. That's a fair point. And it's a I don't think issue. people knew that when they, got, when they started yeah, posting those photos. Maybe not. And that, that gets to one of the larger and, questions and, here of are they disclosing fairly and cleanly mm -hmm what's really going on in I this space. And that, there could be some social, that maybe the major social networking sites are really great in that regard with the terms of service, but there's, as you, you've proved, Adam, there's like thousands of social networking sites that probably aren't. I yeah. guess what's remarkable that we ought to, again, just to get to this social network versus everyone else, on the web, you don't have any control of these things. You put them on, and unless you somehow Absolutely. protect it, someone takes it, someone copies it, you're screwed. The blame that the social networks get is they've kind of given you some control over it and it's not perfect and so all of a sudden we have some control we can tag we can untag well why didn't it disappear i untagged it and so by giving some control we're all of a sudden desirous of full control i, I think the uh, uh, let me just add this other piece perfection here will screw everything up if we're ready to accept pretty much you know good enough not easy to find right the employer you know the private detective and the government may get it if they really want it but I'm not easily, 
Why can't we, and again, I don't think this is something easy to legislate because there's nuance here, but I've written down all kinds of scraps you know, on my desk and, and I didn't intend for every one of them to be part of my archives or to be published for posterity, but I didn't incinerate them either. right? There's a degree of permanence that exists every time we do something. Sometimes it's a, it's a blog posting. I want everyone to see it. I've put it up there. I get that it's available. Sometimes it's a blurt. right? And what's interesting about social media is that they've given us interesting opportunities to be public but to kind of blurt and, and say the things that we might say you know in a side room but yet they're public and and they're obscure and all of a sudden they're not so obscure anymore because they're easily available in search it wouldn't be a terrible thing if what we did do is allow some of that data to decay and i get that it's not impossible to find but right. Did I need every twit and tweet that I did to be archived in the Library of Congress, or should some of those, you know, decay over time? Maybe so, my notes on Facebook should exist forever because so who determines note. who determines that? I'd like to determine that. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that the technology shouldn't try to assume, hey, this is a note. People don't want their notes to go away. The status update, maybe that, maybe just like my um, email pops up every so often and says, would you like to archive these old items now? In which case, they'll be there, but they're not going to be so easy to find. But, but the question the, the question is, like, can can legislation, regulation, uh, quasi-regulatory quasi, you know, bodies, can they be helpful here, establishing some kind of benchmarks or best practices? Well, they can offer more functionality to allow the sort of thing that Jules is talking about. An easier data deletion or portability is certainly So there is a role for government and regulation. Well, I mean, here. the question of how you provide better notice and how you encourage more data deletion is an interesting one. Some of that could be forced by law. I think social and market norms are already okay. forcing a lot of it. Okay. And, I, and I think that's a good discussion to have. Okay. I think the problem is, do you set the default by law? That's where you run into Okay, problems. let me um, get. I want to get to um, you know the Teen Bill of Rights for you know, you know advertising and collection of information, and also I want to finish on on everybody's favorite topic, COPPA. So uh, let me let me just let's talk about the the Marky Barton legislation has this kind of uh, Teen Bill of Rights, and it basically uh, talks about fair information practices for teens. Um, how could you be kind of against that? And, and uh, um, don't we all want a, a, a privacy bill of rights? And number two, uh, it also says that teens should be able to opt in uh, for targeted advertising. And, uh, and I want to ask you guys both about both those points. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, look, anytime you're going to discuss a, a teen bill of rights relative to everybody else's bill of rights, you get right back to the discussion about how you verify ages. There's just no escaping this. And you have to have a discussion about how you have a, age segmentation online for 13 and under versus 13 to 18 versus adults. And this is hey, what, a what if you, we've what if you target your site? Years on what if you target party. your site to like your site is called 14, like the 17 magazine, but your site is called 14? So you're you're making it clear that you're directed at only 14 to 18 year olds. Actually, and what happens when kids? Yeah, and what happens when kids yeah. under the age of 14? Or let's say let's say you're on a social networking site and you say I'm my 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 profile I'm 15, and they know that you're 15. Mm -hmm. why, why shouldn't why shouldn't the legislation allow you to the teen to uh, opt in to targeted or behavioral advertising? And, 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 and I think that's probably where we're heading, but the better question is why would it not just cover everybody the same way? I think, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but uh, my, my friends at CDT probably have the better answer on this, which is that the easier way to do this instead of trying to segment everybody by age is just to have a uniform privacy, you know, bill of rights or comprehensive baseline approach to the issue. I, okay. I think I, there are other downsides to that. Yeah. Justin, don't tweet that. <laughs> Too late. Uh, I'm not endorsing that. that. Super injunction. Yeah, super injunction against you. Uh, I eraser button that. Um, <laughs> so the point is, is that you go down the age verification path as soon as you get into the question of teens, kids, adults. Better to have a unified standard. I, I appreciate the point that a, a broader approach and a privacy right for everyone is the technologically much simpler and st more straightforward way to, to do this. I'm also willing to take side bets on whether that can actually happen in this Congress, in the California legislature, or anywhere else. We support the idea of any of these proposals around do not track or better protections. Our general response at Common Sense Media is we agree with that, comma, especially for kids. It's technologically more simple. On the other hand, respecting those challenges, we have to also address the challenge we have right now where we have a framework that, we, that basically says at 13, you are a credit card carrying, fully enabled, fully adult person in the world. Go out there and 
best of luck. And that's not the way most of us feel about 13-year-olds. I think it that's gets an squishy at each. Yeah. It's, and it's I, all over. And I, if, I, if I may be provocative, Jules, for just one second, it, pushing back on Adam and CDT's approach to kind of we should do this as – Not mine know, and CDT's. It's the CDT's. Uh, <laughs> you, that's why you said I, should, I don't believe I'm saying this, and I lumped you guys together. Um, the idea that everybody should be treated, treated the same. Actually, I, I have a PowerPoint of yours, Adam, from a – congressional briefing you gave like last week, and you, you've listed all the different sectoral and segmented approaches to privacy the United States has taken. Um, basically, your statement that we need to do this all for you know privacy rights for everybody um, really kind of flies in the face of our entire legislative history with regard to privacy. We, we, privacy we, we do privacy by class, by age, by sector, by type of data, whether it be financial, health, um, whether you're watching uh, cable, sub cable subscriptions, you're renting videotapes. The, that, that argument is, flies in the face of uh, the entire history that all of us cite as far as how we've approached privacy in the United States. Yeah, but I mean, the, we, we've taken an opportunistic approach to privacy as, sort of as needed to deal with certain problems. Or is it opportunistic, or is it these are classes of data that we realize that there's a real problem here? Let's yeah, try there's to There's an extra it. sensitivity, so we have something like HIPAA. And teens don't, there's no t files. extra sensitivity for teens. No, no, there is, and we have COPPA. But what I'm saying is they that don't, COPPA doesn't apply to teens. Model, to, I know, uh, applying that model to thir under 13 is a totally different thing than over that, n that number. And the reason for that is because the types of sites and the types of services that are dedicated to, to kids, that sort of internet junior, as I've called it in a paper, is going to be a totally different kind of thing to handle and an easier thing to handle than mixed audience sites where teens, adults, and others could be present. And that regulatory challenge, that practical issue of how you deal with that is something that it, it, you can't oversimplify by saying, well, we had to decide to have a law for teens. Look, That's the true. administration supports the first time we've had an administration support a comprehensive FIPS-based privacy law. If we don't, and, you, and you've got leading relevant members on each side of the aisle and each side of the, uh, you know, of the avenue proposing serious bills, and you have the FTC maybe on the verge of supporting comprehensive legislation, if we don't have this in the next couple of years, it's going to be because of Do Not Track and some of the kids-focused stuff, which takes us down these you know, rat holes and we're debating Do Not Track up and down the kazoo. At the same time, the big solution that probably makes the most logical sense, as hard as it may be to get, probably gets shunted to the side. We're not debating here today comprehensive privacy legislation, how it should work, the commerce view versus others. It we're debating side rat holes, which are, are – frankly going to end up resulting in probably nothing happening. Okay, well, uh, in well the and worse than that, r resulting in potentially more expense for parents and kids to get online because there's no free lunch. I mean, what has provided all these sites is advertising, and that's made it so that it feels like a free lunch, even if it's really not. So if we go down the path of making everything more heavily regulated, you will get a world that looks more like COPPA, that's more consolidated and okay. more costly. Well, but in I don't want to let industry the off the hook. I mean, today we've all said, oh, Behavior advertising, certainly for kids, right? Everybody's agreeing around kids. But, but the rules don't, at least on the industry self-regulatory side, clearly take behavioral advertising targeted at kids' sites when you don't know that it's a kid off the table. Most of the responsible ad networks don't. But we ought to step up and make it clear, right? Before we start the teen debate, let's make it clear that if I'm at, you know, Nick Jr., um, I shouldn't be in a kid's profile that's used to, you know, tailor things to me uh, elsewhere. Okay, I've, I, we have four minutes left, and what I'd like to do is actually uh, end, on, the, end the, on some COPPA questions and then go to the audience for one question, uh, hopefully from a congressional staff or a member of the press. But um, uh, interestingly, I, I did kind of mention Mark Zuckerberg is, um, uh, talking about uh, the need for better education and how social networking can play a role, and we think that's really a positive thing. Um, he said that for education, you have to start at a really, really young age, and he said, when asked about COPPA and under 13, he said, that's a fight we take on at some point. Um, and I, I, again, I tried to get the exact spe text of the speech so I could put it in context. I'm not sure Basically what he's saying. what he said, but he kind of also backed off it yesterday. But, yeah, but I, I, I asked for the, the look, speech. I mean, look, the is he is saying that COPPA should uh, – um, COPPA should be lowered or, or under, under 13 should be allowed on Facebook? Is I don't that know what he's saying? saying, but I think what he's probably getting at is the realization that most of the rest of us kind of acknowledge now, which is that guess what? There are kids under 13 on Facebook. And there was a recent consumer uh, report survey that suggested, I forget what the number was. 30. Seven million, I think. Is it? Okay. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I'm not quite sure how they came up with that. I think it was a survey, right? 
So whatever, we know that there are some kids. We're going to have to have this discussion. You know why? Because COPPA, whether we love it or hate it, we can agree on one thing, and even the COPPA supporters will say this, it has created a generation of liars. There are kids right now who lie because of COPPA, and their parents, as Dana Boyd's research shows, encourage them to. We need to figure out how more, um, how more sites today are in uh, yeah. We need to figure out how more sites that are aimed at kids either. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> this was, we've been cut off. <laughs> Super injunction. <laughs> <laughs> we do need to figure out why it is that sites that want to serve kids either um, say, well, you know, we can't have any information and so you can't get too interactive, or we're going to screen you out and pretend that we're effectively screening you out. We need to figure out what can be done to make compliance or some way of providing a safer, less advertising intensive, less risky environment for that younger audience, which is already there, whether we like it or not. So are so you saying that COPPA, even if the Federal Trade Commission does a few, few um, tweaks to COPPA, you're saying it, it, it isn't even holding up now. Is that what you're saying? I think by the fact that there are millions and millions of kids lying or with their parents lying or intentionally lying and ending up in these environments, it's better than nothing. It's accomplished something. But I think we need to face the reality that there is this unserved middle group that is in an adult environment because there isn't a good enough way to screen them out. And the companies can't actually even say, I know you're here. I'd like to give you a, a little bit safer uh, an environment because, boom, now they're violating COPPA. So I think we've got to start the process of scratching our heads and saying, what are we going to do with this invisible liar generation um, who are clearly engaged? What do we do? I, I want to address the internet, the, the liar generation concept. If you think COPPA is what, what is creating a generation of liars on the internet, I encourage you to check out an internet dating service. Kids are not the only ones lying on the internet. <laughs> COPPA <laughs> has led to some unfortunate reactions, but we should get back to what the core principles are there, which is helping parents be the gatekeeper, especially for young kids, and protect them from the things they don't want, especially things like behavioral Well, marketing. last time I checked, parents can do that if they exercise parental responsibility. You know, this is part of being a good mentor to our kids. But let's be clear, expanding COPPA puts us on a collision course with free speech and anonymity rights and other sorts of questions about age verification. It leads us right down the path of where we were already at with the 14-year legal rat hole that was COPA. And we've already fought that fight. It was unconstitutional. COPA so far hasn't been challenged that way, but it could if expanded. And let's not lose sight of the, the central irony of expanding COPA, a privacy-related measure, and it incorporates things that look like COPA means that eventually you're going to have a law that was put on the books to protect privacy requiring the release of more information or collection of more information about individuals, parents and kids. That's the central irony of COPPA expansion that's inescapable in this debate. Well, I don't think, I, 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 as I read the Markey Barton legislation um, and put SB 242 aside, I don't see anything about age verification in that. No, you don't. Of course, it doesn't answer this question, does it? It avoids it. It intentionally avoids it because it doesn't want to talk I about it. I don't think it avoids expert. it. I think it puts it in the hands where it should be. Let, let's let set the bar up here and ask the companies to do what they can to put fixes in place. We're not looking for a 100% solution, just as Jules outlined before. Perfection's impossible in this space, but the idea of using better tools, the example I, I gave Alan, the I mobile don't, space before. I don't before. disagree with anything you're saying, except that it's a legal matter when you institute that framework by law and have penalties to back it up and FTC safe harboring provisions. It all depends on what goes into the new COPPA rule, right? Right. And then it's a different question. It becomes a legal question, and I'm telling you that if it requires, requires as it will, some sort of age stratification or regulation, verification, whatever, it will be litigated and COPPA will be thrown out. You will lose what you've got right now. We can we can agree to disagree. Is it going to provide any answer to this? I wonder. Is the the national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace is that going to provide it's, any? We've been solutions? trying that for a while, right? I mean, we'll see. Well, Ad, a little end on Adam saying that if COPPA is tried, it'll be thrown out. Expanded COPPA, COPPA 2.0. A, a paper by which I have a name, a, a paper by that name. Uh, you can find. I just I'm, I'm not even it. sure. I'm, I'm not even sure what COPPA 2.0 right. is, but. All I know is that we have to end right now because in 10 minutes or so, we're going to start lunch. 
and we start the State of the Mobile Net conference with the first panel on the state of mobile apps, the what and where of mobile privacy, which will kind of pretty much continue on this discussion in kind of a more of a, a general uh, uh, discussion. We also are expecting um, uh, Senator Leahy, Congresswoman Eshoo, and Congressman Lada uh, to make some comments at some point within there. Um, I also want to point out that um, my organization, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, does not take positions on any, uh, legislation for or against. And so if anyone says any, anything otherwise, I'll slap a super injunction on you, and I'll hit the eraser button. And then I want to thank Common Sense Media for hosting this event today, and our panelists, Alan, Adam, and Jules. Thank you so much, everybody.